Well, good morning all. Great to see you today. Thanks for joining us the 4th of September today as we begin the psalm for today, Psalm 90, talking a lot again about vocation. And then we're also going to see that same thing when we take up the New Testament reading in Ephesians chapter 4. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Well, hear the psalm for today from Psalm 90. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And the work of our hands is simply the vocation that God has given to us to continue to do. And we all have different vocations and yet all for the same purpose, to provide for us, to provide for our families, to continue to um, do good to those around us, those good works that St. Paul talked about in Ephesians 2 a couple of days ago. It's interesting at the beginning of the psalm when the psalmist says, Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. It's like the servant is crying out to God, Remind me again of your promises. Return, bring me back to that, that solid faith in the midst of my groaning that I might trust in you. And we know he does that in his time, but always through his word. He strengthens and encourages us. Chapter 4, as we get into this part of uh, Ephesians, remember we're talking now about unity. Yesterday it was Jew and Gentile alike God came to save, and today he drives that even more. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. By grace, but grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all obtain the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood and to the measure of that stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning and craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way to him who is the head in Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when, it is part, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds, 
They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. And they have become calloused and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off the old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the word of the Lord. Well, Paul jumps in. He doesn't want us to, uh, to misunderstand what the life of Christ looks like. So he lays out very clearly, first in chapter 2, by grace you're saved. In chapter 3, God saved all people, and he wants all to be saved. And now here, Paul lays out what this looks like. As you and I, no matter who we are, Jew or Gentile, as we live our life, our life should be surrounded in these things. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another a love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You see, St. Paul lays it out very clearly when we go forward that the marks of a Christian, we could say that, he'll say this in Galatians, are the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Those are the same things we see reflected here. That is the fruit that grows out of being a Christian. And if we say, I'm not patient, or I don't have any of those gifts, it would be easy for us to excuse ourselves to sin. But those gifts are given to us by the Spirit, And they need to be nurtured. They need to be exercised in order for them to become strong. Just a little bit under this, Paul starts this talk. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called into one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. If you count them, all the ones, there are seven. It is Like Paul is highlighting the order of completeness, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It's all the same thing. It's all one given to us that we may continue to live in this grace and mercy. This verse that he has here when he says one Lord, one faith, one baptism, that's really one of the strong verses that we use as we push back against some other denominations that say you need to be re-baptized. One baptism for the forgiveness of sins because God works where his name is. And we know in baptism, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he gives his name and where his name is, he is and he works. There only needs to be one baptism. Anything more than that is really accusing God of not working when the baptism happened the first time. So we continue to hold to one baptism of faith. Paul goes on, he addresses kind of this vocation of what it looks like to live this Christian life. And he says this at the bottom. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, and evangelists. We, we need to stop right there at those three, actually apostles and prophets, because those are specific things that are talked about in the time of Paul. Apostles, those who are eyewitnesses of Jesus and went on. The prophets of the Old Testament, we know who they were. And even the evangelists of Paul day, Paul's days, like St. John, who are John the Baptist even, who was the one proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Those are kind of a one-off, a one-time thing that he was talking about in that day of Christ with those offices. And then he goes on and he moves into today and offices for us. The shepherds and the teachers. And that's really when we're talking about that, we're talking about the position of pastor shepherding the flock and then the teachers that the the teaching or the pastoral ministry is also a great teaching ministry 
You might remember in Timothy, when Paul is writing out Timothy, writing to young Timothy, who is going to become a pastor, he says that the man who considers this noble position should be apt to teach. And that's part of it as well. Thanks for tuning in, by the way. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, a part of the, the office of the pastor, to equip the saints, to give you what you need for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ until we obtain the unity of faith. You see, they, they say oftentimes that the pastoral ministry is preparing people for death. And that sounds strange, but all of our life we're grounded in the promises of God. All of our life we're grounded in what Christ has done for us. Our identity as a baptized child of God, our confidence in the faith that we are forgiven because of Christ and the cross, and our boldness to go forward knowing that the evil one cannot snatch us out of God's hand. The pastor continually does that, and those are the very things that prepare us for that time when we go to be with Christ. Until we all maintain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. The unity of faith is something that God has given to his church. We talk about denominations and splits and everything. And when we talk about that, it's not that God is wrong. God is right, but we sinful men do not want unity. We all want to be right in our own corner. So we manipulate things so that we're right and you're wrong. But what we should be doing more than anything is praying for the unity of peace that we let the word of God convince us and drive us and, and that we live our Christian life in this true doctrine that he has given to us. Paul continues to work through the rest of this. He gets to the end and he reminds us what this looks like. He reminds us what this new life is. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You see, the old self, the old Adam, the old sinful nature continues to want to come up and pull us away from Christ. That's the very reason that Luther starts off when he talks about how we should get up in the morning. He says, when you get up in the morning, say the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and the Ten Commandments, make the sign of the cross, sing a hymn, and go to work. Well, making the sign of the cross is remembering our baptism remembering we're forgiven, remembering that Christ has made us new. And then our whole day is a day of repentance, for asking forgiveness for the sins that we've done. And that remains, that keeps us firmly grounded in God's word and the forgiveness of sins. To be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That's ours, that's yours, through the forgiveness of sins that Christ has given to you. This is chapter 3. Tomorrow as we gather, we'll jump into uh, chapter, f or that's, excuse me, that was chapter 3. Uh, tomorrow as we jump in, we jump into the end of chapter 4 and then into the beginning of chapter 5. Well, the catechetical review for today as we gather takes us again to holy baptism where God gives us his gifts. How can water do such great things? Certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water does these things along with the faith which trusts this word of God in the water. For without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism that is a life-giving water rich in grace and a washing of new birth in the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. That's just what he reminded us of in chapter 4 of Ephesians. We pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have called us into this unity of your word through the waters of holy baptism. Strengthen us in this, that we may continue to turn our eyes to you in all things. Forgive us of our sins and strengthen our faith. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, dear saints, enjoy your day. I look forward to visiting with you tomorrow. Remember your baptism. Go in his peace.